Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is many a true nerd, and welcome back to Fallout Tale of Two Wastelands, where last time we visited a ridiculous number of alternate universes to see the various weird and wonderful random encounters of Fallout 3. And today we're back in much more familiar territory, picking up a couple of missions in Broken Steel. And that means we're kicking off with my best friend in the whole world, Scribe Bigsley. Don't get me started about Rivet City. They feel entitled to everything. Always whining about how they're our scientists and all that crap. Like they did us a favor. Thought the security deal we'd worked out with them would be a win-win. And my hope was they'd completely take over the water caravan escorts by now. But I got Officer Le Pelletier bitching about an organized bandit syndicate. Guess they don't have the chops after all. I need you to go visit Officer Le Pelletier and lend a hand. So let's just nip over to Rivet City and uh, I do enjoy Carlos, by the way, the water beggar, sitting right here. Can you help me? I need water. Purified water, please. So, you know, his deal is that he's dying, he desperately needs water, etc, etc. But I can't help but notice the place he's sitting is uh, literally in sight of Project Purity. Okay, he can see a source of purified, clean water from where he's sitting, but he just never goes there for some reason. I do enjoy, by the way, how the roads get noticeably busier in Broken Steel. Like, just today, at random, when I'm visiting Rivet City, there is a one caravan right here, a water caravan, and then behind them, Crazy Wolfgang and his trade caravan. The roads actually start to get a bit on the busy side, which is delightful, so... Okay, let's go find ourselves an officer to speak to. Not sure how much you know. There's been an increase in attacks on the caravans. Seems organized, and not just the random raider or mutant encounter. I'm running out of resources, and I'm down to my greenest men. I want to get to the bottom of these coordinated attacks. The sooner, the better. So okay, Rivet City is running into trouble, and naturally, they don't have that much manpower. They've got finite people inside the ship, so yeah, she can't really afford to be losing people out in the field. So point me in the right direction, I'll go investigate. I need you to escort a caravan from Project Purity to Canterbury Commons. If, or rather when, they get ambushed, I need you to figure out who's behind the attack. And just indeed, what makes you so sure an ambush is going to hit them? I'm pretty certain any caravan will be attacked. This particular caravan also happens to have my most junior men escorting it. They could really use someone with Wasteland experience leading the team. Alright, fair enough. Leave it to me. I'll go track them down. In fact, there is something rather peculiar about, yes, the exact caravan you're trying to track down, which is... It doesn't follow the same route as every other caravan in the game, so this here, this is not the caravan we're after, it's a caravan that just set off from Project Purity, you may notice it's immediately starting to turn around to the right over here. Basically, it's going to follow the exact same route the Liberty Prime did in reverse. It's going to go up the slope here, cross the bridge, down a bit towards Andel. That's the route every single caravan follows. With the exception, for no well-explained reason, of the one particular caravan you're tracking down, which, for reasons best known to itself, has decided to chill out under the bridge over there, as if it's gone down this narrow path right by the water, which no other caravans do, but screw it, we'll give it a go. Just a mosey on over in this direction. I believe the caravan I was just looking at is actually distracting the mutants for me, which is just magnificent. And in just a second, as we get a little bit closer, we should start to see some trouble. It is very difficult to save this caravan, by which I mean impossible. Like, you might be able to save one or two of them, potentially. But yeah, when you do first arrive, the caravan itself should already be down. So, I'll take, yeah, a nice 65% of you. That looks like a lucky hit. Then just keep on keeping on. Okay, hang on. 60% at the head. If we can get one of them, that should be a hit right there with that angle. Lovely. Your head's exploded, meaning we should be able to just take you out too. 66%. See if we can just get one. Lovely. Well done. Okay, for once, we actually, yes, kept security alive aside from... Hang on. Did, did you just take out a random trader? 
He did nothing to you. He was not part of this ambush. Yeah, that's just the trader who um lives under this bridge. It is just a trader. Normally he would just die in this ambush due to the raiders, but I just took them out so efficiently. Yes, on this occasion, the poor guy got gunned down by Rivet City Security, which is I mean completely unnecessary, guys. Dear oh flippin' dear. So yes, the moment you arrive, the Brahmin itself is dead, as is the water caravan driver. It's impossible to save those guys, there's just nothing you can do. But yeah, these guys, if you're fast enough, you can keep them alive. They came out of nowhere. I need to get back to report to Le Pelletier. She'll want to know what happened. Thanks for the help. They're honestly not that interested in, you know, talking, to be honest. They just want to be on their way. What we're more interested in is, yes indeed, the various corpses. Here we go, one note, a new meeting place. And while we're passing by, do bother to, yes, collect their stuff off them. The armor, I mean. Still, we'll get to that in a minute, because first we've got the tape. Hi, I'm Split Jack. I'm recording this because I figure half you idiots can't read for shit. But you best don't lay this tape around just anywhere. If you're listening to this, it's because one of my boys thinks he can trust you. If he's wrong, you're dead. If he's right, then you're gonna be rich. Got us a plan, see? We hit the water mules with the Brotherhood busy fighting the Enclave. Soon they'll want to give up the whole delivery thing. Then we offer our protection services. Wasteland's dangerous and all. We charge them steep. On top of it, we sell the water to whoever we want. If you want in, Ride out with the next ambush, stash the water when it's done, the regulars will show you where, and then get up to Grandma Sparkles. Grandma loves visitors and keeps her mouth shut. That, and she cooks a mean stew. So that's where we meet. Wilhelm's Wharf. It's on the river. Don't get lost. Oh, and memorize the passphrase. It's Meyerlurk Stew. If you forget it, don't bother coming round. You'll get shot. No kidding. So there we go. We know where to go. We know what to say. And uh, I'm going to be honest, Jack. Um, Grandma Sparkles uh, isn't doing so well. That was kind of my fault, actually. That does keep coming back to haunt me. And thus we come back to that armor I was picking up. Because, uh, yes, it's not just, you know, a gang with a passcode. It's also a gang with a uniform. So there we go. We now look the part. We know the password. Uh, let's go say hello to our new best friends, the Raiders. Okay, literally just arrived. And, um, yes, massive explosions in the distance. Probably mutants firing something or another over at uh, Talon Company. Don't worry about that, just yes, more people are wearing the correct armor, magnificent. Let's go and have a chat with Mr. Jack. You're one of the new recruits, huh? And look at that, already wearing the gang uniform. You best know the passphrase though, or you're dead. He's not kidding, by the way. If you don't know this, you just have to kill them all. So, my alert, Stew. Okay, you're lucky you knew that. Don't know who let you in, don't really care. This is a real simple gang. Whoever's the toughest sets the rules, and that's me. And I got just one rule. Do what the hell I say when I say it. Now find a seat. We're waiting for some of the boys to get back. And there we go, now we just get sit down for a second though. I will say, I feel like this is one of the most unfortunately short missions in the game. Because it's already almost over and it would have been really cool to, you know, join this gang. I have to do some really dubious stuff in order to work your way up the organization, etc, etc. But no, basically there's only one thing left to do, which is take control of this gang really, really weirdly fast. Also, I have no idea why the game indicates you ought to, like, you know, sit down and wait for the rest of the gang, by the way. Because, um... Yeah, no one actually comes, and uh, nothing happens if you wait. You just need to speak to Jack again. Number one, a simple speech check sorts it out. They'll basically realise, yes, they're not going to pay to protect something they're giving away for free, so he'll just wander off and do his own thing. Option number two, literally just, you know, start shooting them. Murder everyone here, the situation has been dealt with. Option number three, which sounds the same but actually isn't, Time for someone else to take charge. You and me, right now, time to die. This isn't declaring war on them. This is a challenge of leadership. One-on-one, -on -one, me versus him, to decide who's going to run the gang. 
You got a death wish? Fine by me. Knives, pipes, or boards? Because yes indeed, I now need to select a weapon that I'm going to be fighting this guy with. And uh, this is the dumbest fight in all of Fallout 3. It is so stupid in so many ways. It is just hilariously silly. Because obviously, you know, all of these weapons are, are melee weapons. So if you're not really set up as a melee weapon user, you're not going to be doing a huge amount of damage with any of them. But sure, let's go for pipes, buddy. Great. Here's a lead pipe. Use that and only that. I get hit with something other than that or by anyone else, and my boys join in. Good luck. You're gonna need it. And thus begins the fight, though, yes indeed, to make sure we don't actually, you know, just fire or anything. Lead pipe, etc, etc. And now at this point, he's got a lead pipe, and I've got a lead pipe, and everyone else is going to stay out of it, because this is a one-on-one -on -one thing. Aside from, yes, a couple of small problems, which is... There are rules to this fight, rules that can be surprisingly difficult to obey, which is, in the event you've got a companion, they will join in, and if they join in, everyone else declares war, you've just ruined the fight. In the event that you've taken the Mysterious Stranger perk, and the Mysterious Stranger helps you out by firing during a VATS round, everyone else declares war, the fight is ruined. These idiots are going to get up and start cheering the fight in a second, and they're going to be standing really nearby to Jack. If they get hit, by mistake, the fight's over, you've ruined it, you've just got to kill everybody, and that's before you get to the dumbest thing of all. This lead pipe is in okay, but not spectacular condition. And this guy, meanwhile, is... See, they're trying to get closer. He's wearing, like, you know, really tough armor. He does block and... Okay, there we go, I almost hit one of them already. They literally run over, they're standing so close to the fight. Like, this thing is losing condition pretty fast. So going into VATS is uh, the best option, because bare minimum in VATS, you do get bonus damage with the melee, so that's a good. Uh, and you can't block as well. You can't actually block. There's my crits. Obviously, you get a tiny boost to crit chance in VATS too, but seriously, because we're both wearing really good armor, this takes a long time to do, and your weapon is losing condition. He's running around, everyone else is consistently running further towards the fight, which is just very, very silly indeed. Just put you over there, there we go, into the water with you. That's not a crime, that's allowed. Then he does come back out, so just block him, etc, etc. Keep on keeping on, but yes, in the event that your pipe breaks before the fight is over, which can absolutely bloody happen, then... There's basically no way to win the fight. It can't be done, because you have to use something else. And I've officially broken the fight somehow. Does anyone know how I broke the fight on this occasion? Because two of these bandits are running away. I think possibly, like, you may have been hit by something, and you've decided it's my fault. As I say, this is the dumbest fight in Fallout 3. Like, I don't know what's going on in it, but half the time, something goes wrong. Okay, let's just go back in time and try this again, damn it. Okay, went for a combat knife on this occasion, because yes, that's a bonus crit chance, which kind of works in my favor. And also, yeah, the AP cost is pretty low, so for me, that's probably going to work just fine. But the problem is you can absolutely, I definitely just, yeah, I just hit somebody else in VATS and they've immediately turned on me, haven't they? Yeah, yes they have, because this is the dumbest fight in the entire game, it's so stupid. Okay, I've gone for a nail board on this occasion, and I'm going to start doing cocking psycho in a desperate attempt to end this fight before, like, you know, I accidentally hit the wrong person or whatnot. So, uh, here we go, just mosey on in, just finish him off nice and fast without hitting anybody else if you'd be so kind. And uh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay, good start, good start. This is, uh, this is excellent. Then maybe just back away over to the pier. That might, like, you know, get me a little bit of uh, space between me and his guys, but they just insist on running over. So close, they can absolutely mess with your cocking vats rounds. Okay, the fight's going well. It's now time to move away so that, yes, there's a bit of distance between me and Jack, but bloody hell, she was just standing right next to the bastard. This is not, not helpful, guys. 
And if we're lucky with a crit or two, this might be it with a board on this occasion. So, yes, it took me three attempts to finish this fight without actually, you know, upsetting the rest of his bloody gang. And bloody hell, down he goes. Okay. Now, the game is at this point prompting me to just, you know, go back to Officer Whatsaface and say, Hey, the job is done, etc, etc. But, um, that's not actually the only solution. Killed the boss, fair and square. Good job, kid. Normally, that'd make you the new boss, but we're all tired of bosses. But we like Split Jack's plan. So, if you can get that bitch at Rivet City to buy into our protection services, we'll split the take with you. So, we don't need you to be our leader. But we will cut you in on the protection racket. If you can get Le Pelletier to sign on. Again, it is just a bit of a shame that you can't, you know, work your way up the gang. And, you know, being gang leader actually means something. But no. Instead, if you become gang leader, they decide that's the exact moment. Actually, gang leaders are overrated. And from now on, they're just going to be like, I don't know, a representative raider democracy or something. So now that we've spoken to that raider, now's the moment to go back to Rivet City. So you can't just say, hey, I killed Jack, she'll be happy with that, because yes, the person who was running the ring has basically been assassinated, that's all A-OK, -okay. but then if the gang ever sees you again thereafter, that's going to cause trouble with them, they're going to attack you on sight. Instead, yes, let's have a chat about a protection deal, because they said they could cut me in on it, and it's way more lucrative to side with the gang than the officer. What? Though I will say, the reward for this mission is really weird too, which is uh, you need to pass a speech check in order to get to pay 500 caps up front. And after that's done, that's it. The easier option, because there's no speech check, is uh, 200 caps a week. And uh, once that's been set up, it continues uh, every week forever. So basically, it's a source of uh, infinite ongoing money for you. So why would you ever take the 500 up front? Yes, it is a bit of an odd one, that for some reason, that's the trickier one. But instead, the ongoing payment, that's the easy option. So 100%, that's what we're going for. I can't believe you're trying to extort me. I'm trying to do the right thing here, and you're totally taking advantage. You're a horrible person. Fine. Tell your gang to send someone over once a week. I'll find some way to get the caps. But you... I never want to see you again. I trusted you. If you come around again, I'll kill you. You understand me? I'll kill you! She's not joking, by the way. She really cocking means it. I warned you not to come around. I will not be extorted. Look what we have here. And there we go. She pulls out her... Not plasma rifle, actually. And then she just puts you down. But yes, this mission does have a rather special place in my heart. Just for containing the dumbest fight in possibly the entire Fallout franchise. Like, the fight against Jack. It's so stupid. Still, on to something a bit more meaty. Unfortunately, we're only just down the road from my real main objective today. Here we go, back to the Citadel. And we need to catch up with Lions. Here we go, literally just say hi to him, that gets me a giant pile of XP, just about enough to push me into the next level. That completes death from above, and just, you know, literally telling him what happened, Liberty Prime dead, etc, etc. And we now need to go and visit Paladin Tristan. Right, handful of explosives, a handful of medicine, and... Gosh darn it, I'm going to ruin a lovely round number right now, and I do not enjoy doing that. Fine, melee weapons could be 28 in honour of the fact that, yes, we just, you know, did some melee stuff. I did notice, by the way, that due to a quirk of how I built this character, I am missing, like, you know, what should be an absolutely bloody essential perk for this build. Which is, I don't actually have better criticals, which is hilarious, because, yes, you need Perception 6 for that, and Perception in Fallout 3 is absolutely flipping garbage. So, yes, I never actually got better criticals. Like, every crit I'm getting, which is, with some guns, like, every shot I'm firing, I'm doing 50% less damage than I should be. And you know what? I'm going to take my favourite perk that never cocking works, because... Uh, Oh, I love a meltdown. Like, conceptually. If you kill an enemy, they might explode and trigger the enemy next to them to explode and trigger a massive chain reaction of exploding dominoes off into the distance. Like, that's how it works in my head. 
Obviously, it never does. But screw it, I like the idea of it, and I always take it, and it's never as spectacular as I wish it was. Okay, Tristan, fill me in on what we're doing today. With the setbacks the Brotherhood has suffered, we find ourselves in a difficult position. All our available resources need to be positioned for the inevitable counterattack from the Enclave. At the same time, we believe we may have developed a tool to help our chances of victory. But with everyone needed to help defend against the Enclave, we have no one to send on a recovery mission. So, I'm going to have you travel to the Olney Power Works to secure some tech for us. And unfortunately, yes. Even if you've already been to Old Olney and you know precisely what's waiting for you there, you can't object or tell him about that in the slightest. In fact, if you try... I'm sorry. Perhaps there was a misunderstanding. I'm not asking you to go. I am, as your superior officer, ordering you to go. This is your assignment. You are to proceed to the Olney Power Works. Once there, you are to locate and acquire a Tesla coil and return to the Citadel with it. Now get moving. You know, I'm really not sure I ever actually agreed to be part of your, like, you know, command structure. And also, yes, most definitely ask for additional help. Check with Scribe Valancourt. She's been researching some of the Enclave technology we've recovered. From what I understand, she may have come up with something. Oh yes, she's come up with something hilarious, in fact. Now, you don't need to go and speak to her, but you most definitely should. Here we go, Valancourt, hiding inside just a cupboard for some reason, actually. Right, what have you got for me? I don't know how much this will actually help. I mean, I'm not quite sure how effective it might be, since it hasn't really been field tested. But I think I've figured out a way to override the signals the Enclave is using to control their death claws. Here, take this. It's only a prototype, so please don't lose it. Sadly, as hilarious as this sounds, it really is a bit of a one-off gimmick device. You just can't really use it basically anywhere, actually. Aside from this one camp where you get to have a bit of fun with it. But screw it, we're going to have as much fun as we can get away with. Here we go, I've already been to Old Olney, but no, 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 let's not start there. Instead, we're going for the mysterious Enclave camp that's just appeared over here. So, uh, yes indeed, the disposal site, that'll do as a good starting point. Oh, and before we even get there, okay, I think we've actually just stumbled into, yeah, some lovely Type B random encounters you may recognise from last week, which is... Uh, Enclave troopers just on the road, uh, taking on some Talon company. So, uh, okay, Enclave winning that one, obviously. No need for me to get involved. That's not actually, you know, the Enclave I'm after. Instead, uh, there we go. Now, I'm already pretty sneaky, but um, yes, if need be, I could just move in and then activate a stealth point because, you know what? This is working pretty smooth so far. Just get around the back of here. There is the death claw cage. Just need to uh, crack that open. The officer's got a key too. I don't really need that, however, because... Uh, oh, it's literally average. Oh, that's fine. It's just, uh, yes. Crack you open, buddy. And this guy's now on my side. So uh, he's just going to uh, pop out, do a nice roar, etc., etc. And in just a second, uh, the Enclave might realise uh, they've got a small problem on their hands. Though... Are you just standing there and doing nothing? Well, that's just cocking. There we go. All right, there we go. They figured it out. He's going to go and respond. Uh, so yeah, kind of depends what spawned in. Like, against the basic troops, the Death Claw will win. Against Hellfire, I would put money on the Hellfire. Just uh, pop out over here. And excuse me, please leave uh, my new friend, Mr. Slashy, alone. So just uh, pop you in the head. Good sneak attack. Your head pops off. Uh, brilliant. I think we've also got ourselves... Uh, right, that's just an iBot. Don't need to worry about that, to be honest. Take you out. How on earth did you miss that first shot? Then, uh, hang about. We've also got ourselves... Uh, Gosh darn it, there was one a Hellfire Trooper. Well, okay. No gunner for you, if you'd be so kind, actually. Then just pop up the, uh, yes, armor-piercing. John, you've got four armor-piercing bullets. It's really not that impressive, actually. Still, should do something a bit in the head right here. Lovely. Give him a go. Okay, you know what, screw it. Just knock him over, it's fine. All right, just knock him over and then shoot him in the head. He'll go down sooner or later. 
there we go. Job cocking done. Right, that done, we passed by only previously when we were on our way to... Was it Vault 92 or was it... No, we were visiting the nearby camps, weren't we? And, uh, yes. You don't need to, like, you know, take out every death claw or anything. Just, you know, avoiding a handful. That would be just fine, too. Because what we're after here isn't actually, you know, the entire town or anything. We don't need to clear out the death claws. Instead, we're after one very specific thing. And that is literally just in town, and then a loop around the outside here. And uh, here we go. The sewers. We don't need uh, anything else whatsoever, in fact. Yeah, we're sufficient sneak. You can just uh, walk on in. You'll know you're in the right place because of the giant pile of corpses. And here we are in the sewers. So, uh, okay, we got a couple of people to meet down here. And then, uh, would you believe, uh, yes, there's going to be plenty of this. We can't just get around uh, without fighting. Sooner or later, we're going to have to take on a death claw or two. There we go. I think I see one right over there, probably glitching into a door because its tail's just going back and forth. So, uh, okay, just out of interest, like, didn't really bother checking my loadout before I came out here, but... Lincoln Trapita. That'll do the job pretty well. Let's just get over to here. I've got hollow point, nothing else. Just get around to you. And uh, okay, you know what? I'll take that. That's pretty good, all things considered. All right, just pop a few shots in there. And uh, get a crit or two. That should be enough to take you out. Though, yeah, they do advance pretty fast through these narrow corridors. Some of the time anyway. Rest of the time instead, they just sort of get stuck in the doorway. It's a bit of a lottery. Still bare minimum, bit of money and a stealth boy in the safe sea was guarding. So yes, this was worth doing though. To be honest, that's not really why I came this way. The real way is yes, when you come in, you want to turn right. If you just, you know, take a small excursion down in this direction, you get yourself, you know, a handful of wastelanders, mercenary skeletons, but more importantly, a dead member of the Brotherhood of Steel, and he is wearing a very important piece of armor indeed. The Prototype Medic Power Armor. So, the Medic Power Armor, designed to protect the soldier in the field and serve as an automated medic. The prototype unit we've got here only has medics delivery systems. The production unit will include stim packs and other injectables, so... Okay, I can't prove that this thing is, you know, somehow distantly related to the stealth armor in New Vegas. But I would like to think, you know, obviously they were both developed for pre-war military, so they may have had some connection to each other. Who knows? And this here is my most favorite thing in the whole wide world, I say incredibly sarcastically, talking armor in Fallout. I do not enjoy talking armor in Fallout. Like, I can't even bear to keep the stealth suit on for too long. Like, it just annoys me how bloody chatty the armor is. Listen up, you goddamn puke. You are now wearing prototype medic power armor. You take care of me, and I'll take care of you. Although I will say, I believe this armor does make less random comments just out of the middle of nowhere compared to the stealth armor. And yes indeed, as I was saying, what it does is it plugs and medics into you. But what it doesn't tell you is it does it in a rather clever way. Oh bloody hell, I've got too used to my light armor. I feel like I'm walking through glue right now, it's awful. Right, just need to find somebody who's going to come and, you know, give me a couple of light taps with the claws and whatnot. Time to kick some ass! There we go, just letting me know I've entered caution, and in just a second, uh, yeah, keep on keeping on, uh, soon as we go over to, uh, there we flipping go, I've just been injected with Medax. Except here's the rather fun thing, which is, uh, yes indeed, I've now been given the effect Suit Medax, which is different from regular Medax. Obviously in this game, Medax gives you damage resistance plus 25, but a couple of added benefits to the suit giving it to you. Such as, uh, number one, it suppresses broken limbs. So even if you've got broken legs, uh, you can run at your normal speed, which is marvellous. And number two, there's nothing to stop you using Medax the traditional way too, just a jabbing it in your arm and giving yourself enough a hit. So yeah, the suit lets you double up medax. Whether this was like intended or not, I don't know, but it's how it works and it can be rather useful. But you know what, I think I'm good without that in general. I'm much happier being able to, you know, move around at slightly ludicrous speed. Oh, now that's a much better, yeah. So, okay, that's hidden away on the left as you come in. But as I say, where we're supposed to be going is off to the right. Once you've, you know, taken out the rest of the death claws and whatnot. 
I should point out though, there is actually, yes, a much easier way if you don't care about the medic power armor and you'd rather just skip as many death claws as possible, which is, uh, yes, if you come in to the northeast side of town, right over here, in fact, you know what, let's literally travel back in time for a second. Here we go, you're looking for the top corner of the town, right here, and this lovely building, the kind of whatever this is, like an old school or whatever, right there. So we need to do, let's just mosey on over to here, wait for that death claw to be, you know, not looking in this direction, or whatnot, then we just mosey straight on in here, drop down to here, straight inside. And there we go. We are now basically already towards the end. Though, unfortunately, on this occasion, that guy did see me and was able to follow me. So, okay, bit unlucky there. But had I activated a stealth boy, this would be going a lot smoother right now. Because, yes, assuming if he doesn't follow you in here, there is literally one death claw in the tunnels right there. Then you just go through this small room right here. There's a robot here. Don't bother. Honestly, you know, what's he going to do to bloody death claws? Instead, just a mosey straight in this direction. And here we go. This ladder would take you straight to the next section. So, with a stealth boy, you could probably very easily skip all of that. Even without, I just got a bit unlucky. That guy turned around when he did. So, like, you know, one death claw and just straight on to the next. And speaking of the next, on we go to the Oni Underground. What the? How the hell'd you get in here, smooth skin? And straight away, we get to meet a couple of lovely individuals who just want to say hi. Wint and Kid, two ghouls who are just hanging out at the start of this area, and uh, these guys are bloody weird. Like, not them themselves, they're fine, nothing wrong with them, but why are they called uh, Wint and Kid? Like, the names are so distinctive, there's only one answer we can come to, which is uh, they must be named for Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd, the two assassins in the James Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever. But in which case, why? Why are you named after two assassins in Diamonds Are Forever? These guys are not assassins. They don't quit with each other or finish each other's sentences, which is the style in which Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd talked. They don't appear to be in a relationship of any description, which Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd were, in the film anyway, not in the novel actually. But um, yes, for some reason, like, someone just named these two ghouls after two characters in Diamonds Are Forever, who they otherwise have no similarity with whatsoever. I do not know why. Anyway, let's have a nice chat to these individuals and figure out what's going on with them. Hey, uh, I'm Wynn. Uh, this is Kid. We're, uh, well, it's kind of a long story. Only thing that matters now is that we're trying to steer clear of the death claws on account of not wanting to be lunch meat. So, funny old thing, when he says it's a long story, he's not kidding. It's just not one the game Fallout 3 actually tells you, but you can figure it out. So, okay, we'll get to that, but yes, in the meantime, there is a rather good reason these guys are the only survivors. Yeah, we ran faster than the others, that's how. Ain't nothing honorable about it, but we're still alive, and they ain't. I can live with that. Listen, this wasn't my fault, okay? It wasn't my idea to tunnel down here. I just went along with it. But whatever. What's done is done. Me and Kid, we're getting out of here. You came in that way, that means we can get back out. See you later, Kid. And there we go. They're happy to just leave because I've already cleared the way for them, though. As I say, potentially if you came in the back way, you might very much not have cleared the way for them. Let's just roll back the clock for a second though, because yes, if you actually ask why he's down here, you do get a lot more information. Look, this wasn't how it was supposed to go down. It was a good idea at the time, you know? Figured we'd try and set ourselves up down here, just like Underworld, only better. Who's gonna bother a bunch of ghouls living underneath old Olney, right? So, we get down here, we start knocking some walls down, and the next thing you know we're getting our faces chewed off by death claws. What I do like about this conversation, though, is uh, it does kind of fill in uh, not really a plot hole, but something rather curious in the Fallout 3 base game, which is uh, why did nobody know about Old Oni? Like, it's a giant death claw nest. They're not hidden or anything. They're literally walking around outside and around it on the streets, etc. So uh, why did nobody know about it? Why could you direct slavers to Old Oni? Why did Dave run there? after he lost the election. Like, surely everybody would have known about the very large obvious Deathclaw camp, and 
It's because until very recently, they weren't above ground. And these guys, when they were knocking through walls, accidentally opened up the nest, meaning death claws above ground and only. That's actually a very new and recent thing, which is why the slavers and Dave didn't know about it and thought it was just an abandoned ruin. I mean, okay, I'm gonna be honest, I may be overthinking that one, but if it is intentional, it's a very cute touch. And straight away we run into, yes, what was the beginning of their brand new underground town. Like, you know, new underworld, if you will. And it is rather cute. I particularly like over here, the bathtub with like a bath toys and drugs in the form of uh, the boat, the gnome, the jet, etc, etc. And if we just nip upstairs straight away, we run into a named corpse. So Badger is just, you know, wearing a standard hat, wearing a standard outfit. He's got a name, but beyond that, we know literally nothing about it. But, um, as I was saying, there is actually slightly more to Badger's story than meets the eye. Mosey on a bit further, hang on over here. Hello there, Connolly. Lovely to meet you too. Then round the corner, we've got even more. So yes, we've got Dunbar here, except Dunbar has got a note on him. And he is right next to Carl, lovely, who is wearing Wasteland Doctor Fatigues. Remember that detail, that's actually kind of important. As in fact, and I'd not realised this till just this second, is Badger, who is wearing, yes, the Storm Chaser hat and the Wasteland Settler outfit. So, okay, just keep all these details in your brain, because they actually kind of matter. And then we've got one person unaccounted for, and this one's hilarious. Just, uh, mosey on straight through here. And in just a second, uh, the Deathclaw tosses the corpse down the hill at you. Say hello to Sanders, our last member of New Underworld. So just, uh, mosey on upwards, because as we just mosey into the hospital proper, just put a bullet in your back. Oh, blimey. Okay, Armor piercing combined with a sneak attack crit. Now that'll flip in do the job, actually, yes. So now that we've got everybody accounted for, let's check in on Dunbar's notes. If you're reading this, it's because you might be able to help. We're thinking about branching out. Underworld was a good start, but we found an even safer place for us to set up a new place to call home, Old Olney. No one ever goes there, no one would even think to look for us there. There's tons of space under the town, so we're looking for a few strong backs to help knock down some walls, clear some space underground, and help get things up and running. S. So presumably, therefore, S must refer to Sanders. Dunbar, meanwhile, as he was actually holding the note, presumably was one of those people who was recruited to help out with that business, and... Uh, that's all the information you actually get in the game. You can't learn anything from Wint or Kid, they'll never tell you anything at all, and these individuals are dead, there's nothing on them aside from that one note. Unless, of course, we go to my favourite source of canonical but not really information, the Fallout 3 Strategy Guide, where somebody decided to write an entire piece of fan fiction about where they came from and what they all did. So thanks to the Wasteland Census, we know that Sanders used to hang out with Roy Phillips. He was part of his crew, and he broke away and left as he didn't want anything to do with the attack on Tenpenny. Colony, meanwhile, presumably was part of the same group originally. He must have been a hanging out with Roy Phillips too, because the notes do seem to indicate he wanted to join Roy and rather reluctantly followed Sanders to the new settlements. As for Badger, he left Underworld after unspecified disagreements with the local leaders and was responsible for gathering food. So, presumably, Sanders and Connolly left Roy Phillips, travelled to Underworld to recruit more labour, and travelled north all together to get to Old Olney. And Badger, his job was gathering food, suggesting, presumably, he was the one that went out and about, did some scavenging, etc, etc. Which might be why he's wearing a hat because he's the one that went out into the wasteland more often to go and scavenge more foods. Dunbar, meanwhile, we don't really know anything about, aside from the fact he was also originally from Underworld, where apparently he had a bit of a crush on the shopkeeper Tulip. And Khan, according to the Wasteland Census fanfiction, was their doctor, presumably, therefore, a student of Dr. Barrow's in the chop shop. And as I was saying a second ago, the lads are wearing doctor fatigues. So yes, his outfit matches up with his story and uh, this doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't mean anything. But I find it rather delightful that at some point someone bothered to write a tiny piece of fan fiction for who these individuals were, how they got here and what they all did. 
anyway, that's enough of that. Out of, yes, new underworld and into the old hospital. There's also clear signs that, yes, something was going on down in this basement already at some point in the history. Though, it's hard to tell precisely what or when, because uh, obviously, you know, the ghouls were killed as soon as they cracked into the hospital. Presumably, the basement is where the death claws were based. But, um, yes, there's a lot of uh, human-style stuff going on down here as well. Barricades, frag mines, guns, all the rest of it. To my mind, the most likely answer is yes. If you just go down to the very lowest bit of the basement behind a series of locked doors, you can find some skeletons right next to one, a radio, and two, a Chinese assault rifle with a whole bunch of ammunition, suggesting possibly Chinese infiltration in the basement of this hospital before the Great War occurred. Okay, many dead death claws later, we've got to our next destination proper. The old Olney S. Wilson building. And this place is just downright bloody weird. Because, well, one, we've changed out our opponent. Which is, uh, no more death claws instead. Uh, now it's the Enclave. So just, start, you know, be a bit on the careful side. Uh, obviously cooking Hellfire Troopers. It just bloody had to be. And we've also got, as you can hear up above there, one a lovely vertebrata. But don't worry, we can actually do something about that on this occasion. Just, you know, put some normal bullets into you. In fact, you know what, that might not be fast enough. How about... Yeah, go over to uh, Lincoln's repeater here. Take a few pot shots at you, buddy. There we go, do enough damage. He starts moving away, but it's always too late. He explodes straight afterwards. Marvellous. Okay, I've brought a fair bit of ammo for the pulse scanner. Whether I've got enough or not, I'm not sure. Just, uh, mostly straight on over to you. A couple of good shots in, or whatever I can hit most reliably. Should take out you and yes, a single bounce round. Beautiful. Crit's doing absolutely nothing, of course, because they just don't. Because that's a kill, that gets me my thingy McJibble back, or my AP. Meaning I can move uh, straight on to you. So yeah, the only question now is, uh, do I actually have, you know, enough ammo to finish off the entire group? Though you can just, yeah, bypass some of them, I think, because, yeah, the power works is just the far side of the room. So, really, there's only actually two in the way, though there may be a couple more dotted around lower down. But we are going to go and say hi to, because, uh, yes, this room, there's some weird stuff in here. So, funny old thing about this building number one, which is, um... It doesn't exist and can't exist because uh, you may notice this is uh, a very large building with, you know, an open top and a giant radio transmitter that's collapsed on its roof. And if I just nip outside and also into the sky for a second, uh, maybe it's supposed to be this one? Like, this is probably the best bet, but even then, no radio tower. Just, there's not really a good candidate for this building that we're in. I don't really know where we're supposed to be precisely. Weird thing 2 part A. Though honestly, okay, this bit is pretty par for the course for Fallout, which is uh, if you just uh, mosey on into the northwest corner, you've got yourself a one gnome who appears to be playing, yes, a card game with a teddy bear. But based on the exact positioning of uh, the sexy sleepwear, I'm guessing, yes, this is a game of strip poker that's not going well for the teddy bear. Now that's all fine and dandy, you know, gnomes and teddy bears and whatnot, in all sorts of uh, weird amusing positions in Fallout 3. That's all over the place. What's really weird about this location, however, is uh, there's a second one, but it doesn't exist in the level. There is no way to see it unless you cheat. And here we go, located in space, there is a gnome holding an iron who is attempting to iron a teddy bear. As for why, I don't know. Like, this would make no sense if it was in the level, but it's not. Instead, they've just sort of left it hanging here in the void outside this one tiny level you pass through for one split second of broken steel. And I have no cocky clue why. And then at long last, we come to my greatest nemesis of all. The cocky police hat. Okay, I know this is going to sound uh, like a very small and slightly insane thing, but me and this police hat, we have got problems with each other, okay? Because uh, somebody, for some reason, added this police hat into Broken Steel. 
Just to be clear, all right, we're not in a police station. There is no police station location in Broken Steel. There is no pre-war character who is a police officer. There is no faction who wears police officer hats. But for some reason, somebody added a police hat in Broken Steel. And the police hat, it doesn't do anything. It's just a normal hat that gives you plus one perception. But somebody was really, really proud of their police hat because after they dropped it in a couple of locations in Broken Steel, and there are like four more of them, it then kept showing up. All right, in Point Lookout, there are several police hats. There's even a cocky police hat in Mothership Zeta. Somebody made a completely out of place police hat that does nothing and then kept sprinkling it in all the Fallout 3 DLC from Broken Steel onwards all throughout 2009. And I don't know why, and I also don't know why it bothers me so much, but seriously, why is there a police hat here? And also in Point Lookout, and also in Cocky Space. Okay, you know what? Let's just move on, okay? It's fine. We're just going to ignore them going forward. Let's just, you know, mosey on, because, as I say, this entire location is just one room, because uh, shock value is a weird bloody mission. Still, we've just about reached the end of it, and yes, this is easily the best bit, to my mind. The power plant itself, because naturally, there's plenty of cocking science to be done here. Let's just uh, mosey on up here, and... Uh, Okay, to be perfectly honest, yes, I did just remember there's a lot of sentry bots in this location. And um, kind of used up all of my pulse already. There's some lovely sentry bots right there. But that's fine, because as we were just saying, there are a lot, and I mean a bloody lot, of terminals that we might be able to make use of. Here we go, let's just start shutting down some workers. I can't remember if you guys are the workers. Are you guys the workers? You appear to have been the workers. Marvellous. So, okay. That terminal shuts down the sentry bots. Brilliant. Meanwhile, over on this side. Uh, oh, yeah. We've got the very hard terminals. Which, ironically, are often the easiest. Because, uh, yeah, you've got kind of, you know, certain very similar words. Like a whole bunch ending in shun, for example. Resurrection, purification, etc, etc. So, uh, straight away, we know it's none of the shuns. Over here, all the ones ending in ing. Okay, definitely doesn't end in ing either. And with so much space filled up by the words, it's actually easier to spot, like, you know, the removal of duds, or replenishing your allowance, etc, etc. There we go, got allowance replenished right there, and now I know it's not an ing and not a shun. This should not be too difficult to do. See, I can rule out you, I can rule out you, I can rule out you. You theoretically could be it, not you. You're only a one out of ten, a marvellous... And there we go. Pretty much by process of elimination, we get it nice and easy first time. And this fortune lets me just skip forward a fair bit straight towards the end. Lovely. So yeah, if you've got Science 100, you can literally just skip straight towards the end here. And I will admit, this room is pretty bloody cool. Alright, and I do kind of feel like in some ways, possibly, someone designed this really cool looking room, and then they just sort of built a mission around it. Also, I really enjoy this tiny side room next to it, given, you know, clearly someone just had the idea, hey, it's like, you know, a side room in a power plant where science is going on. There should just be like, you know, sciencey things in the room. Just make it look sciencey. So, a harp on down. Obviously, you could hit the emergency switch to cut off power. I'm pretty sure I could get away with just grabbing this, by the way. So, uh, all right, screw it. We'll give it a go. <gasps> And, oh my goodness, I was actually able to survive just grabbing that while it was live. Just. Very, very literally just. The one the way out, do make sure you take notice of it. Yes, indeed. Alien power cells once again. Seriously, it's the best untold story in Fallout 3. Like, I know aliens do show up in Mothership Zeta, but I mean, pre-war. There is so much study of alien power cells all over the place. Like, the pre-war US government 100% knew about aliens, had recovered a fair amount of alien technology, and was clearly working on, you know, figuring out its secrets. And with that all done and the coil in hand, let's be on our way back outside to Olney. Because yes, there is a lovely emergency escape hole right here. Though obviously, you know, this is locked until such time as you come up on it from below. And there we go, back to the Citadel. So shock value done, I just need to literally hand it over to Tristan. But how about with that complete, we call it apart there. Because next time, Tristan's going to be very keen on me going to the presidential metro. Who dares wins, wrapping up the game, etc, etc. And uh, 
I want him to give me that mission so I can, like, you know, start opening a few unlocked doors in downtown DC, but I most certainly do not want to rush to Who Dares Wins because, uh, yes, there is uh, one more mission hidden away in that bit of the world. Arguably one of the weirdest missions in all of Fallout 3. And once we're done with that, there's a few other, yes, odd little bits and pieces dotted around the wastelander. So join me next week for some weird and wonderful hidden bits and pieces. Hopefully you're looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been Fallout, Tale of Two Wastelands. Thank you very much, and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes! My stupid, stupid plan has worked! It turns out I'm a genius! The giant rat scorpion is not gone! Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet, though. I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.